Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alex, for those very kind words uh, about me and about geography uh, and also to, to Ben for, for reaching out. It's, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I want to talk today uh, about the book. Let me see if I can make the presentation work. Uh, the Probiotic Planet, with that, which Alex mentioned, um, which makes some very grand claims about changes in how life is conceived and managed across different domains of health and the environment in the West. But to ground it in some work we've been doing at Oxford over the last five years in the LEAP program, so the Livestock Environment and People program, which is an interdisciplinary program of research funded by the Wellcome Trust, thinking about how the livestock industry and the food industry in general are responding to the challenge of climate change as we come to think of uh, a closer kind of critical analysis of the livestock uh, industry and its relationship to climate change, how different actors are responding to that challenge. Uh, and in particular, to think about uh, the place of cattle uh, and the place of meat. Um, so I want to ground a big discussion of the probiotic turn in some specific examples of how the livestock industry are taking up some of the themes I sketch out uh, in the context of the rise of what's called regenerative agriculture. To set the scene, I want to start with a, a short video, uh, which many of you uh, will have seen, uh, which came out a couple of years ago uh, and is an advert for Burger King. Uh, let's see uh, if we can make this work. Uh, we've got it working, um, but we've got no sound. Many of you would have seen this video. When cows fart and burp and splatter, well, I need um, no laughing So maybe if I just talk about the country western soundtrack just playing in the background. Um, and the boy here is singing about um, concerns the that Burger King have about and the uh, and how they've commissioned you. research by scientists yes, uh, and that the that the passive that the cattle and enable uh, is it just me to eat, uh, so to change their emissions burping went on a mission I guess what I want you to attend to is that they not having a soundtrack like uh, and is this interesting in conjunction with science and um, kind of pastoral imagination of the cowboy and uh, the particular lady they are thinking about the reducing methane and the scientists have proven that it was the general kind of affirmative story that runs through this about when the The video, it's only got a couple Must more minutes. Uh, and particularly this last series, series, series of images. Uh, so here they're passing through the guts of the cattle. And the formula is free and open source. Uh, so join it, it. red is sick This is an advert produced to go viral online, um, has had you know, a fair amount of pickup, quite a lot of criticisms, as you could imagine. Uh, I want to suggest, uh, if we circle out from this story about uh, manipulating the guts of cattle, is we can see it as part of a set of probiotic responses to the crisis uh, facing contemporary agriculture, contemporary health, uh, in which there is this interest in using life to manage life. So an interest in manipulating the ecological dynamics of different systems uh, in order to deliver desired functions and services uh, that have in some ways been lost because of the blowback, the overuse of antibiotic approaches to managing life. And by antibiotics, I'm clearly interested in specific chemicals. You know, when we think about antibiotics, we think of pharmaceuticals, um, that have you know, become very important in delivering health, but also thinking about antibiotics in a more systematic way to describe the rise of a whole set of approaches to simplify, smooth, control, and rationalize the dynamics of ecological systems across different scales. Um, often these involve the substitution of organic inputs, whether that's human labor or animal labor or animal manure, uh, 
um, pest control done through um, you know, various kind of interventions into the ecosystem with the rise of organic or synthetic alternatives. And lots of these have clearly been central to the modern project, clearly central to uh, you know, the application of natural science and modern technology to understanding and managing life across different scales. So we can think about this in the context of agriculture in the ways in which uh, antibiotic, antimicrobial chemicals have become ubiquitous in the ways in which food is produced. We can think about the systematic eradication of parts of ecology that are required to enable agriculture to take place. We can think about the rise of monocultural systems that involve this smoothing, simplification, acceleration of ecological dynamics. And think about it right up to the landscape scale and the ways in which we've come to organize drainage, the ways we've come to organize fire, uh, which are all about controlling, smoothing, and simplifying uh, the dynamics of ecological systems. We might also think about this in terms of how we uh, make food, um, the rise of a, a kind of pasturian model of uh, food uh, production uh, involving, um, in many cases, the elimination of, of, of microbial life, um, the standardization of all sorts of antibiotic hygiene practices into kitchens, into institutions, uh, into, uh, into workplaces. And there's obviously a lot to be ce celebrated from the application of these antibiotic approaches. So the, the graphs are quite small here, but these are various long run trends tracing how some of these technologies helped overcome the kind of Malthusian challenge of you know, feeding the world in the context of growing population shown top left there. We have cereal yields and cereal production, you know, which have been very much enabled by the application of these technologies, increasing life expectancy, uh, declining incidence of malnourishment uh, in many parts of the world. Obviously unequally experienced, but I don't want you to get uh, a sense that I don't think there are important uh, elements to, the, to, to, to antibiotic technologies. But what we are seeing is a growing awareness of the blowback of these antibiotic approaches, a growing concern that they have gone too far, the systematic application of these approaches is leading to a series of unforeseen or unwanted effects. And we can think about this across a range of different scales. Uh, so we can start with the microbial scale and think about this growing understanding um, that a whole series of contemporary non-communicable diseases, allergic, autoimmune, inflammatory diseases might be related to missing microbes. So not related to a particular pathogen necessarily, but related to what's called dysbiosis, the kind of loss of microbial diversity and abundance, uh, particularly within the human body uh, that might be leading to these epidemics of, of absence. We can think about this in the context uh, of growing concerns about antibiotic resistance, uh, both in agricultural sitting situations, we use a lot of uh, antibiotics uh, in animals, often the same antibiotics that we might use therapeutically for humans and uh, bacteria have this amazing ability to exchange genetic material between, uh, between each other such that resistance develops in the farm and you know, then could, could cascade out into, uh, into everyday society, but also growing concerns that uh, intensive agricultural systems create these hotspots uh, for uh, disease emergence, hotspots particularly of zoonotic disease emergence. Um, in the words of Rob Wallace, that big farms make big flu. Um, we don't have definitive uh, knowledge of the origins of COVID, um, but we have similar diseases that have cascaded out of industrial agricultural systems uh, and, and traveled globally in different ways. Okay, so this would be another example of this concern about blowback in this case of using antibiotics or the ways in we've rationalized agriculture to simplify animal lives in these intensive animal production systems. But we might also scale out to think about comparable developments that are going on in natural resource management on a landscape scale. So for much longer, ecologists have been concerned uh, about what um, Holling and, and Meth here call the pathology of natural resource management when it's done under a command and control model. So again, this model, which is about simplification, smoothing, accelerating uh, ecological systems, creates the conditions for extreme fires, creates the conditions for uh, disease outbreaks, bark beetle here in, in plantation forests, creates the conditions for extreme flooding events as we try and accelerate the passage of water through landscapes. It creates situations for extreme events. And we might even scale this up to considerations in earth system science around uh, the rise of the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene 
is this hypothesis that the planet is tipping out of the Holocene into a new uh, epochal state. Uh, in James Lovelock's terms, it's the revenge of Gaia, a kind of planetary scale blowback to the excesses of various antibiotic ways of, of managing the planet. So the book makes this argument, but then it becomes interested in a, a range of what I describe as probiotic approaches uh, to tackle some of these problems. Uh, and probiotics, you think of uh, particular single strains, uh, particular uh, often um, strains of bacteria that might be delivered in pill form or delivered in, 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 in yogurt form. And, and, and these like antibiotic chemicals are interesting and important, but for me, they are um, less relevant than thinking again more systematically uh, about ways in which scientists and policymakers are using life to manage life. So using um, particular uh, understandings of ecological dynamics, for example, configured around the idea of keystone species, species that have disproportionate agency within an ecology uh, to restore desired functions and services to tip systems that have become dysbiotic back into uh, a state that we might want them to have uh, in, in the future. And we can trace this probiotic turn, I argue in the book, happening across a range of scales. Okay. So this is a, a, a table with an awful lot of text in it. But if we move left to right across the table, I'm basically tracing the story that I've just given you uh, of the rise of the antibiotic model, a series of blowbacks to the antibiotic model, and then a series of probiotic alternatives that are trying to remedy the problem sketched out on the left. And then the rows in the table are moving out from the microbial to the macro and right up to the planetary. Okay. And clearly this uh, table masks a great deal of difference. Yeah. There are important differences between the micro and the macro, but I think it offers a useful heuristic to think about this broad trend that's going on across different scales as various uh, scientists, uh, policymakers and citizens try and use life to manage life, try and redress some of the problems associated with the antibiotic model through these targeted interventions, these recalibrations into managing ecological uh, dynamics. Today, I'm gonna to talk mostly about agriculture and forestry, um, but in some ways what's going on in agriculture and forestry mirrors some of this emerging interest in, in the microbiome, about manipulating the microbiome, about giving lemongrass to cattle, for example, as one manifestation of that. Uh, and tomorrow when I talk about beavers, I'll talk a bit more about conservation uh, and the way that beavers, again, which are appearing as this archetypal ecological engineer are also being used in this guise to you know, tackle uh, issues to do with both flooding and, and droughts in different places. Okay, so that's the big context. Uh, let's try and ground this then in a discussion about agriculture and particularly about livestock uh, and the management of cattle. Okay, so we need to understand this in a much longer history, uh, a much longer history of human cattle interactions. We have a very long and storied history of, of, of interacting with cattle, a longer history of the wild aurochs, which is the species from which all contemporary cattle are domesticated. The aurochs is now extinct, um, but we have many, many breeds of cows in, in different parts of the world. A uh, history of cattle domestication uh, and of the rise of a whole range of different uh, cattle management systems, nomadic systems, uh, the rise of kind of sedentary pastoral systems uh, that segue into more recently the rise of intensive uh, animal agricultural systems, the growing meatification of the food system, it's a horrible word, but it kind of captures the ways in which uh, livestock agriculture has really ramped up the production of protein globally, um, the rise of sort of concentrated animal feeding operations, both for dairy and, and beef production. And then really, I guess, uh, in the last 15 to 20 years, a growing concern about the blowbacks associated with that transition. So blowbacks, uh, environmental consequences of the rise of intensive animal agriculture, but also a range of concerns about animal welfare, about zoonotic disease, uh, as well as some of the um, issues to do with, um, you know, the social justice questions around employment in the industry that, that Alex has written uh, so well about. Okay, and this came to the fore, at least uh, in the context of the work that we're doing in, in Europe, uh, around the publication of two very high profile reports. So the IPCC published their report on climate change and land, um, which for the first time, people argue, really flagged the significance of agriculture and its relationship to climate change and really flagged the importance of livestock agriculture in climate change. 
And then the EAT Lancet Commission uh, published their report uh, around the same time. So EAT is a non-governmental organization based in Sweden. They gathered some very high profile scientists to try and calculate some of the impacts of livestock, but also to try and arrive at a, a planetary diet to set some parameters around what per capita people should be eating uh, in different parts of the world. So this put um, animal agriculture very much on policymakers' radars. And some of the data that grabbed a lot of attention were around the disproportionate impacts of beef production. Uh, so this is a calculation of greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of food product, trying to factor in production, but also transport uh, and the other parts of the food system. And we see that ruminants, so animals that digest their food through multiple stomachs, um, are particularly implicated in uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So more than uh, poultry and, and chicken, which are monogastrics, they have one stomach like us, they produce much less methane, uh, that it puts uh, beef and, and lamb production very much in the, in, in the spotlight here. Okay. To the point that campaigners start talking about apocalypse cow. So George Monbiot is a, is a high profile uh, campaigner against livestock agriculture in Europe at the moment. He's written this book called Regenesis, uh, which imagines a future in which we're all fed from protein sucked from the air, this um, solar foods, these kind of new proteins, um, but really sort of putting a spotlight on um, the, uh, the role of cattle, the role of intensive agriculture in uh, driving environmental change. Okay. And this uh, has clearly caused concern amongst uh, those involved in livestock agriculture who feel uh, the need to, uh, to reply and to come up with alternative frameworks for thinking about how to make uh, agriculture more sustainable. Uh, and there's three responses I want to flag here before I get into the specifics of regenerative agriculture. So, so the first of which is often described as sustainable intensification. This is in some ways a kind of doubling down on the, on the antibiotic promise, you know, with more science, more technology, better uh, innovations around genetics, around microbiome manipulation, around big data uh, and technology. Uh, we can radically increase agricultural production, decoupling uh, agricultural production from environmental harm. Okay. So that's you know, one prominent story. Uh, a second story, which is not unconnected to the first, is about bringing animal agriculture to an end. Okay, so the rise of plant-based, what we call big veganism, so a model of kind of corporate uh, plant-based eating uh, associated with a range of alternative proteins, both plant-based meat alternatives, but also this interest in cellular agriculture, in um, you know, growing um, meat in laboratory situations. Okay, um, many of these developments are now supported by uh, animal businesses, um, livestock meatpacking businesses who kind of repositioning themselves as protein providers, where it might not necessarily matter if it comes from the cow, it's a way of providing, providing protein. But here there's a sense in the words of the Oatly advert, it's wow, no cow. You know, here we can do all of this and we can take the cow out of the system. The third version, which for me lines up more closely with the probiotic turn, is the rise of what's become known as regenerative agriculture. And this has had um, a great deal of attention uh, in, on Netflix. These are a couple of documentaries, a range of kind of autobiographical books written by farmers tracking their transition out of antibiotic models of agriculture into uh, regenerative agriculture. Uh, for its advocates, regenerative agriculture is defined as working with nature to utilize photosynthesis and healthy soil microbiology to draw down greenhouse gases. So it's working with nature is the story here. Uh, farming and grazing practices that among other benefits, reverse climate change by rebuilding soil organic matter, restoring degraded soil biodiversity, resulting in both carbon drawdown and improving the water cycle. Oh. So rather than wow, no cow, it's not the cow, it's the how is the strap line we get here. Okay, so they're gonna reposition the role of the cow as a tool for climate engineering, uh, for soil uh, reconstruction. Okay, so it's sort of defending a place for the cow uh, in, in the Anthropocene. A few key dimensions to this practice. So one is this intersection between regenerative agriculture and what's become known as rewilding. So here there's a, an argument that we could bring back a version of the aurochs 
uh, which was so central for driving the grazing dynamics of, of, of at least of temperate parts of Europe. Uh, and you could redeploy the cow uh, as, a, as a tool for, uh, for, for you know, regenerating grazing systems, for generating biodiversity. And, and this involves various efforts to backbreed and de-domesticate the cattle, which are underway in the Netherlands, this Aurochs project, and then putting them out into landscapes uh, and letting them graze and taking a relatively small amount of these cattle off as premium beef uh, on an annual basis. We have this big interest in what's become known as holistic or mob grazing. So trying to replicate the grazing dynamics that were associated with large groups of herbivores that would roam across temperate landscapes. Um, the argument is that uh, historically livestock would have moved uh, in, in a herd and they would have grazed very intensively in one place and then moved on and let that site recover. Uh, and that apparently is much better for soil carbon sequestration uh, if you really hammer a piece of grass and the carbon gets drawn down. Uh, so there's various ways in which this is enabled through fencing or through these very clever collars that have GPS technology on them where you can set parameters for where cattle might go in the field uh, and move around in that way. Advocated in particular by Alan Savory here, who is a, a Zimbabwean farmer who's produced all sorts of handbooks that have become very popular worldwide uh, in trying to replicate the grazing dynamics, either of cattle or of bison uh, in different places. An interest in trying to reverse the separation that's gone on in agriculture between livestock and arable systems, trying to bring livestock back into the farm, trying to return animal waste into arable systems, sometimes coupling uh, cows and chickens in a kind of cycle in which you move cows and chickens through the landscape so that they pr produce different functions uh, in, in, in the soil. Uh, and then finally, and this is where I guess the regenerative agriculture meets sustainable intensification, the sorts of programs that we heard about from Burger King there, which are about optimizing uh, the, the, the guts of the cattle, either that's through kind of microbial interventions to change the composition of the, of the guts so they don't produce so much methane, or through various dietary interventions that will try and reduce the methane. So in some ways, this idea of governing life flows through the cow right down to the microbes in the guts of the cow. It becomes this kind of metabolic machine for, um, you know, for, for producing protein with, with lower emissions. Okay, so that's the kind of empirical story. Um, in the paper that we've written about this, we draw out three uh, political strategies associated with this uh, probiotic turn uh, that are trying to reposition cattle as tools uh, for planetary salvation, if you like. And, and we talk about this as the green rebranding of cattle under regenerative agriculture. Uh, and I just want to talk about these three uh, briefly before we open up for, for discussion. Um, so the first of which is this interest in governing metabolism. Okay, so this real interest in calculating and knowing about the cycles of nutrients, the cycles of life uh, associated with cattle grazing um, that could be known and made subject to various interventions. Okay, so we get this interesting figure of the cattle as a keystone species. So this is a term that ecologists to use to describe a species that has disproportionate impact in the ecosystem that it grazes. Um, but also this idea of cattle as ecological engineers, that they have this ability uh, to fundamentally intervene into, into the methane cycle in different ways. Um, and they work to govern metabolism across these different scales from the microbial out to the planetary in interesting ways. So this centers around um, kind of visualizations of the cow uh, like this. So this is produced by Rewilding Europe, uh, which is a, 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 an organization in Europe very keen to uh, bring back uh, the Tauros, as they call it. So this is their backbred cow. I can't quite call it the Aurochs, they're calling it the Tauros, as a keystone species that will deliver all sorts of useful ecological functions and services uh, into the European landscape. They're particularly interested in places that are undergoing land abandonment, which is quite a lot in Europe as agriculture moves out of temperate regions into the tropics, marginal bits of land are opening up for rewilding. And so here they see the Tauros as a, as a tool for bringing back biodiversity. Okay. So biodiversity is one of the things that's to be you know, governed through this metabolic intervention. Um, and likewise, this idea of, of mob grazing uh, fundamentally choreographing the movement of cattle through fields, through fencing and through GPS collars uh, is about intervening into the carbon cycle. So we can use cattle to draw down 
CO2 from the atmosphere, we can sequester it in the soil, uh, such that they become planetary tools for, for staying within, within planetary boundaries in various ways. Uh, so we developed this conceptually through uh, engaging with the work of Michel Foucault, who's a French uh, post-structuralist, had nothing to say about cows, uh, but offers us interesting ways of thinking about what he calls biopolitics, so the governance of life uh, at the scale of an aggregate. And Foucault was interested in populations, but we were interested in what does it mean when ecology becomes subject to forms of biopolitical power, when various actors can think about the dynamics of the ecosystem, think about the kind of interactions with the ecosystem, to leverage particular versions of that to deliver outcomes. What does it mean for the animals? What does it mean for the farmers? What does it mean for the landscape to make it subject to that kind of, kind of intervention? Okay, so that's the first theme uh, that we talk about. The second theme is very much about the ways in which different baselines are used to justify these interventions. Okay, so baselines is a term that, that ecologists have to think about reference points in the past that you might want to calibrate your restoration projects in relation to. Okay, so if you're thinking uh, in terms of ecosystem restoration, you've got to have some kind of idea of what it used to be like. Uh, so you've got a target uh, to aim towards. Okay. And there's a range of different ecological baselines that are used to justify regenerative agriculture. Um, one of the most powerful uh, is to argue that there have always been big herds of cattle grazing temperate regions lots of bison uh, in North America, lots of aurochs uh, in Europe, um, and we should index our uh, calculations of planetary methane in relation to this past quotient of methane that was once there. Okay, so methane as a gas degrades quite quickly. Um, so the argument is that if we're just sustaining the same number of ruminant bodies in the system, um, then there's a baseline that justifies uh, the contemporary uh, number of cattle that might be in the system. Um, so we get these um, kind of posters that were produced, particularly in terms of legislation that came through quite recently to try and put a tax on methane, both in the US and in, uh, in New Zealand, um, equating contemporary cattle herds with buffalo uh, that used to be you know, common uh, across the Great Plains. And here in this organization, Turning Point, which seems to be a kind of culture wars wedge organization, trying to politicize this on left right grounds. Okay, you know, this is sort of, you know, are you worried about cow farts, you softy kind of story? Um, but also mobilizing a particular kind of paleoecological scientific argument that there's always been this pulse of methane in the system uh, and therefore we shouldn't worry about it. Or even if we draw down methane emissions from cattle, cattle could become part of a net zero strategy. They can be carbon negative. Uh, if you could optimize uh, methane emissions so they emit less, then they're actually part of the solution because relatively speaking, they're producing less methane than they had historically. Okay, so we get these different baselines that could be used to justify different futures in, in interesting ways. Okay. And then the third of which, which connects to the idea of baselines and takes us back to the, uh, the Burger King story, is about the idea of the pastoral. Okay, so the pastoral has this incredibly powerful cultural allure in many, many parts of the world. The pastoral as a place in which people uh, were uh, at one with nature, people were at one with animals, often a kind of version of, uh, of nostalgic history, which is about um, rural life. Uh, it's often set against the urban. The urban is a place of um, capitalist ruin. It's a place of alienation. Uh, it's a place of, of decay, uh, and the pastoral becomes a place of value, if you like, it, for different, you know, often quite kind of racially coded audiences uh, in, in different parts of the world. What's interesting about the version of the pastoral we get here is a version that Heather Paxson, who's an anthropologist uh, here in Boston, talks of as the post-pastoral. Uh, so it's the pastoral that can kind of hold on to the, the idea of culture and tradition, but isn't necessarily anti-science or anti-technology or anti-capitalism, okay? So you can have this version, she writes about it in the context of raw milk cheese production in, in upstate New York, a kind of gentrified model of the pastoral in which you could have the traditional values of cheese production, but squared off with kind of contemporary values about microbiology, uh, about um, the role of markets uh, and the role of technology. Um, thinking of you, Ben, as I'm thinking about this. Um, 
And what's really interesting about this kind of post-pastoral is it helps to justify this idea of what is becoming known as nature-based solutions. Okay, so, so nature, as we know for many people in the West, is a kind of warm, cuddly thing that we're concerned about that we might turn to to provide us with solutions to the contemporary problems that, that we live in now. And nature, you know, as we know, is known best through scientists, but is also found in these kind of organic rural communities. Um, so we think about the Burger King advert as an example of the post-pastoral. You know, it finishes with images like this, the kind of fairgrounds, um, the cowboy outfits, kind of wholesome uh, ideas of tradition. Um, but it can be juxtaposed to these sort of proto-scientists, you know, who with their knowledge and their, and their test tubes uh, will lead us into this bright green future in that way. So it does a kind of a careful cultural work to reconcile two quite different traditions of, of Western thinking about nature. There was a lot more we could say about regenerative agriculture, but those are just three themes that we might think about as we think about the political work that needs to be done to reposition cattle in the context of the crisis that's facing the livestock industry at the moment, as various people get concerned about uh, its, its impacts on a planetary scale. Okay, so just to conclude, so the book is arguing that there's a probiotic turn underway in the weird world. And weird here is an acronym that psychologists give us for Western educated, industrialized, rich, democratic. Okay, so it has a, a particular geography to it. It can be found in parts of what we might call the global south, um, but there's a sort of characteristic to the types of people, the types of places in which it's playing out. Um, these probiotic approaches clearly have historical precedents. They start at different times in different places. Arguably, macroecologists have been thinking about rewilding and biome restoration for more time than microbiologists. But there's this interesting traffic in metaphors and ideas between these uh, different domains. I think one of the key things is that it's not rejecting modern science and technology associated with the antibiotic model. It's very much a recalibration. Um, alongside the post-pasturian, Heather talks about the post-pasturian, a kind of a way in which we might rethink hygiene to hold on to what pasture gives us in terms of knowing about pathogens, but trying to avoid the kind of blunderbuss approach of, of killing off everything, kind of... Um, there's a, uh, a Dutch philosopher who talks about the controlled decontrolling of ecological controls, which sounds kind of like a tautology, doesn't it? How, how can you do that? But if you think it through, actually, there's a, that's in a way what's happening with some of these experiments. It's a very much a controlled decontrolling um, rather than a kind of laissez-faire, let it all go, you know, and uh, we just you know, run for the hills kind of model. Um, so the book tries to thread a path through this. There's lots of different ways of going probiotic, as we saw in the presentation. I think there's various things that we might want to make an alliance with as kind of social scientists, environmental scientists, but there are also quite uh, other models um, that you know, we might want to, to, to be concerned about as this shift uh, plays out on, on different scales. And particularly in relation to cattle, uh, we can think about cattle as a really interesting place to think about the connections between the micro and the macro. Um, we can think about uh, the ways in which cattle are being repositioned as keystone species in this, in this probiotic turn. Um, but we might also think about the ways in which this story might efface other stories about the past or other futures. Uh, and particularly, if we think about a kind of entanglement between livestock systems and ideas of the pastoral with histories of settler colonialism, uh, the kind of the ways in which cattle enabled various forms of acquisition of land in different parts of the world. That is very much glossed in the regenerative agriculture movement. We don't hear about that. Um, in some ways, regenerative agriculture is uh, repurposing a longer tradition of what's called agroecology, uh, which has a very different food politics to it, much greater interest in food sovereignty uh, that often comes out of the global south. So there's kind of big uh, social science questions about who's making these decisions and, and how they're playing out uh, in different places. But I will stop there. Thank you very much for your time. I'm sorry the sound didn't work, but hopefully you've got a flavor for the video and you can obviously find it on YouTube if you want to uh, later. As people gather some questions for Dr. Lorimer, I'll, I'll just pose an open one. I was thinking about the publication date of your book, The, the Un Unprobiotic Planet of 2020, of course, right on the cusp of COVID. And, um, you know, I, I just wanted to ask, 
how do you see COVID, not in terms of looking for an origin or a, a cause, but in terms of its effects in everyday life? How is that played with or against the probiotic turn in your sense? I, I think I, I spent years teaching your work, Heather Paxson's work, Rob Wallace's work, who I believe we want to try to bring to the seminar next semester. And, um, you know, I, I even had a student one gets, once gift me at graduation hand sanitizer because I railed against hand sanitizer <laughs> so much in everyday classes. But of course, um, you know, COVID has been a bit odd in this sense, right? It's feels like, especially in the early days, slathering on hand sanitizer at every given moment. At the same time, as it, you know, teaches us newly about our interconnected biosociality and how we are all, you know, microbiologically connected to each other at the same time. So I'm just wondering how you're thinking about uh, at, the, at the day level of everyday life beyond, you know, policy solutions and, and, and management, how the probiotic turn has been affected by COVID. Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. And as you say, so the book went to press just before the pandemic. They allowed me to write a preface halfway through the pandemic. And I mean, obviously not out of the pandemic, but as we look back over the last few years, it's fair to say it's put a great big bucket of cold water over my optimism around the probiotics as a kind of emerging movement, I guess, particularly on the microbial side on the one hand. And yet it, it has clearly made us all much more aware of invisible microbial things and their ubiquity and their ways of you know, passing between us. And I guess we've all become for better or worse, much more familiar and curious about microbes and the microbiome and thinking, I guess, initially just about you know, creating barriers and, and perpetuating kind of antibiotic models of, of managing it. So I think there's that, I, I guess on the food system side, it definitely, you know, as kind of supply chains started to creak as, um, you know, food security became an issue. It definitely, I think, has got people thinking, in, you know, a little bit more about, about food and, and, and where it comes from. Um, I think it's still too early to say how, you know, how it will ramify through. Um, you know, my hope is that there's a kind of a curiosity and an anxiety um, that could be challenged to think in more kind of ecological ways about, about this. Yeah. Hi, that was really great. I just had a question about how you feel like this reorganization of animal agriculture might fit into also a shift to more plant-based foods. Um, I was kind of paying attention to COP27 and there was recently a big campaign launch about increasing bean consumption in the world as an alternative source of protein. And I just wanted to know how you feel that fits into this shifting of the um, meat area, because it seems like even if you're re rewilding the meat, the main goal is still to use it as food. So just have those two things. Put yeah, together. no, it's a great question. And, and, and I think there's a risk in seeing them separate from each other. I mean, you know, for even the most enthusiastic regenerative agriculture advocate recognizes that we have to significantly decrease beef consumption, which will mean significantly decreasing production. And, and yeah, the yields of some of these systems are so much lower um that it would you know require that sort of reduction and, and you know and, and i guess then the compensation is that you know that um space is filled by by plant-based eating i guess one of the risks is it you know if it's left up to the market it then becomes a very expensive source of food and, and all the distributional consequences of who might be able to afford this kind of meat you know come come to the fore uh, in that way so so i think holistically um it would be seen they talk about less but better as the kind of trajectory um, and would want to make a strong case that there was a vital kind of ecological role for the cow in producing the fertility that might enable plant-based systems. There are clearly others like Monbiot who say we don't need them at all. You know, we, we can do all of this uh, with various sort of vegan models or various um, kind of technological solutions that will create this new proteins in, in different ways. And I guess just finally, there's a kind of complicated geography to this. Obviously, there's some parts of the world where it's very hard to grow vegetables and grow plants and cattle are, you know, in a way, historically, the only thing that you can you could use on the land in that way. So. That was a really cool talk. Um, I'm a big fan of regenerative agriculture, um, but I also think it is kind of interesting to see how everyone's marketing it very differently. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it because you you came across very unbiased throughout the talk. Um, 
but I have some, I also want to hear your thoughts on more specific areas on the topic. So like funding constraints, um, I think is a big one. I'm from South Africa and I know there it's really hard to do conservation because of lack of funding. So people think of creative ways on how to get money for conservation and regenerative agriculture is actually a very uh, useful tool to do it because you can kind of blend it with um, game management. So ecotourism, I'm wondering if there's any similar similarities in like Europe and America that they're applying. And then the part that you talked about methane and tracking it back to like what it used to be with the original ecosystem. Um, I'm curious on your thoughts on whether those were different stable states of those ecosystems and now they've reached different stable states or is it useful to compare methane from a other stable state because now it's completely different. Um, and then the last one is I'd like to hear your thoughts on scale. You don't have to respond to all of these. <laughs> the scale of geography. So like if you are, um, say if you're in the Southwest where there's naturally a bunch of cattle and you're eating beef from a regenerative ag raised farm versus drinking almond milk that's imported from somewhere far away where the, you showed the whole graph with food, different food sources, but like food, I think is like 3% of total carbon emissions at the end of the day. It's like transportation and other things matter way more. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on some of those. Yeah, things. I mean, they're all great, great questions. And um, I want to kind of hide behind being a social scientist and say, I'm not really qualified to provide definitive answers, but I'd probably put my head too far above the parapet to, you know, to, to sit on the fence there. I, I, you know, I think the label regenerative is on the one hand incredibly powerful because it's emerged from within the agricultural industry, you know, much more than other labels, but it has also become very heterogeneous in terms of what it describes, you know, so Nestle can have a regenerative agriculture strategy, which as far as I can see involves doing very, very little, maybe just slightly changing uh, the, the role of the arable production systems through to, you know, some sort of really hardcore uh, transitions that are underway with folk who would call themselves regenerative. So, so I guess we need to think about a set of political, economic, ecological criteria that you might start to differentiate regenerative, regenerative light, regenerative you know, in that way. So, so I think that work is yet to be done, you know, as it's emerging. And, and I suspect there will be moves to try and certify and standardize as there often is within this space to try and come up with the, the gold standard. And, and maybe we'll see that, see that happening. Um, I think the, you know, the sort of paleoecological story about methane is, is interesting. I, I'm not sure how easy it is to answer those questions if you are an, a scientist on the inside. Um, you know, we, we know a fair amount about the paleoecology of Europe and the different states that these systems were in and the possibility, I guess, with the Anthropocene is it's going to be very hard to return to those kind of Holocene conditions. So, you know, what is the kind of the new, uh, you know, in the words of kind of ecologist novel ecosystems or anthromes that are emerging in the Anthropocene that could have some of those kind of ecosystem properties that you'd want from the Holocene, but are going to be non-analog to, to the past. Um, I'm sure somebody can provide, you know, the kind of methane quotient, whether it's a bona fide argument that cattle are the same as aurochs is, is, is more of a political question. Really. Hi, Jamie, a big fan of your work. Um, I am struck by your use of the term branding. And I'm, I'm just kind of wanted to hear you uh, speak a little bit more about kind of where you locate your critical stance with respect to this, this, uh, this work that you're, you're charting. Because I can, you know, I can see, uh, I teach environmental sociology here. I know I teach the, the metabolic rift. So I was thinking about, you know, mm. the, the kind of Marxist rejoinder, which might be, uh, this is all just branding, in a sense, ideological cover for this real metabolic rift, right, mm. which is... Uh, between capitalism and nature. And then a kind of on the another pole would be a sort of interpretive approach, which sort of takes these claims maybe at face value and sort of grants them a certain truth value on their on their own. Um, it seems that to me that, especially with, with your dropping you know, the, the Foucault reference, that maybe there's some other kind of position that you hold. Um, and I'm curious, like how you navigate that. And I'm, and I'm asking as someone who also studies, uh, you know, natural science and Mm. and policy and trying to figure out where I locate myself with respect to their truth claims and and so on. So I feel this is a real puzzle and I'm curious how you how you think about it. 
Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. I mean, branding has this kind of nice etymology about being you know things that one does to cattle through you know putting a mark on the cow, uh, as well as I guess the kind of way we think of it now in terms of you know marketing and and, and all the rest of it. And I mean, there is that really rich intellectual tradition of work on metabolism that comes out of I guess kind of Marxist thinking and and, and particularly thinking about the nitrogen cycle and fertilizer. And, uh, and I think there's a lot of good conceptual work that needs to be done to try and think with some of these elements on different scales uh, in relation to how some of these keystone species are being kind of designed as tools to modify those planetary circulations of these you know, molecules. Um, I sit uneasily between a kind of Foucauldian approach and a Marxist approach and geography has both and they, you know, they were often quite antagonistic to each other. And I think there's a, there's a sort of, rapprochement between them, um, particularly thinking through some of the work that Alex has been doing around kind of non-human labor or animal labor. And what happens if we begin to think of the cow as a kind of worker in this system, producing particular forms of metabolic labor, you know, uh, you know what, where does that value go as the cow gets repositioned as a, a kind of deliverer of natural capital rather than a deliverer of, of protein. But I think there's a great intellectual research horizon conceptually emerging there, but I, I don't have a particularly definitive sense of uh, whether any one of those theorists would be better. I think we could probably use them creatively together in that way. Jamie, I've got a question coming in from online from Zach LaRock, a PhD student in Hasts at MIT. Um, and, and the question is, I'm curious if, you, if, if Jamie might talk more about who's doing the spinning in the probiotic term. You mentioned Burger King as one agent, which makes sense. But what about in the other context you mentioned, which is Europe, a supranational political community? Does the EU's recently announced Green, Green Deal have something to do with a probiotic turn? Are there different biopolitical stakes if corporations versus states are doing the probiotic turning or if they're working together? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And um, I'm not sure how much there is a single answer across different scales. But maybe we think about the rise of nature-based solutions, which is a sort of umbrella term for a range of interventions to try and hit net zero targets. Um, some of that has definitely come from, from the corporate sector. You know, lots of big corporations making net zero commitments, which is now creating a kind of demand for various market-based instruments to sequester soil carbon, which some of these farmers are getting quite optimistic about, you know, that this will be the way in which we could resource this. Um, but I think certainly in the book, I'm also interested in kind of more DIY citizen science led projects in which people are coming to probiotic approaches as a consequence of the failures of, particularly in the health system, what they feel the antibiotic health system can provide them with. So one of the case studies in the book is around helminth therapy. So people using parasitic worms to tackle some of those autoimmune diseases that, that I mentioned. Uh, with varying degrees of success, but with lots of people very enthusiastic on social media about using these worms to tackle uh, dysbiosis in the microbiome. And, and they have a model um, which they counterpose to the kind of um, drugs from bugs model that, that dominates quite a lot of the pharmaceutical industry. And it would be a sort of open source uh, common property model in which people are sharing these organisms online. So I think there is a, there are quite diverse political economies within the probiotic term. Um, and there's obviously a role for the, you know, for the state and for, for business within this. So I think it's too messy a picture to kind of do an either or answer to that, to that question. Hello, Professor. Uh, my name is Pradna and I'm from India, where cow is actually very sacred to us. Uh, my question is around in India and other, a lot of countries in the global south, the whole movement around natural farming, regenerative agriculture is um, around cow manure and, you know, it's very central to that. And um, we see a lot of climate financing and the transition towards zero, way, uh, zero sorry, net zero focused on uh, forestry, but not so much on agriculture. So I was wondering why, you know, when cows have these potential to sequester carbon, and there's, I think, even in US, a movement around carbon farming, where cows are again central. So do you see future investments or um, this fin climate financing moving towards agriculture? And because it can be a powerful tool to create rural prosperity. So I guess it's a great question. And, and yeah, I'm very conscious that the book really misses out on really interesting developments in, in India and, and other places. There's a, 
as an anthropologist, I know Daniel Munster, who's done some great work on um, Kerelan kind of intersections between cow uh, enthusiast, Hindu nationalism, and kind of ideas about microbes in the soil that we, we could talk about afterwards. Uh, there's definitely a lot of hope and hype around soil carbon sequestration as a future revenue stream for farmers. Um, it seems to be very hard to do the science well to work out actually how much carbon is captured over the soil longitudinally. There's a risk that it will punish the farmers who've been looking after their soils quite well, uh, to the point that some farmers who we spoke to are thinking about degrading their soils because they anticipate that there will then be the possibility of increasing the carbon sequestration from this. So it has all these sort of paradoxical, you know, uncertain consequences. I, I think unlike tree planting, where it's more intuitive, you know, here's a great big tree, it's got carbon in it. Soil carbon sequestration is harder to kind of visualize and, and market in, in that way. Yeah. End with a question from Ben Wolf, closed off. Uh, thanks for a great talk, Jamie. Um, I think it's really interesting to think about going from the antibiotic to the probiotic. There's sort of like a cultural element that's driving that, and there's also a technological element as well. Um, do you think one comes first? Is there sort of a cultural response to the antibiotic approach that drives the technology to figure out the probiotic solution? Or is it the technology is saying, there's a problem and we have a solution and culture is responding to the technology. I, or are they both kind of happening simultaneously? It's a great question. I mean, you've sort of lived through this, so you probably have a good sense of it. I mean, my sense is that um, the technology enables a visualization of the problem. So if we think of the rise of Earth system science, which became possible because of satellites, became possible with remote sensing that led to Earth system science and led to, I guess, kind of Lovelock's work and, and thinking ecologically. And then it was only really with next generation sequencing that it became possible to know the kind of complexity of the microbiome, which happens a lot later. Um, so that knowledge then emerges at a particular moment. And I guess for Lovelock, it was Cold War, it was concerns about nuclear, it was, you know, and, and a kind of early chapter of kind of apocalyptic anxiety. The microbiome knowledge is emerging in the context of both the kind of autoimmune disease crisis, but also broader anxieties about the Anthropocene. And you could imagine wouldn't be too hard to extend the kind of sense that that zeitgeist comes to inflect the readings of, of different people. Um, so I think technology has a role, but I don't think it's too deterministic. It's clearly, we need it to just understand, to be able to visualize the interactions, um, but it can then go in some different trajectories in that, in that way. Yeah. Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Lorimer 